Welcome back everyone to Bible Study Hub. We're here to continue our study on the seven seals. We are now at seal number four, right? Um, since December 2022, I have not um, done a study on the seals. I have not done a study um, on the second coming. Right, I've not done a study on much things. This is my first um, study, um, first video for the new year. So I wanna say happy new year to everyone who might be seeing my channel for the first time or happy new year to those who have been returning and watching my videos. Now, without further ado, right, I won't keep us any much longer. Right, I'm gonna go into our study in earnest now our study tonight right is the fourth seal right and as customary we're gonna pray right and then we're gonna dive into to the message so let's pray most kind righteous eternal father and our god as we come before you once more to look at your words but i pray that whatever will be said in this presentation that it would have come from you and that lives will be changed Arts will be touched, right? And people will cry out and give glory to your name. All these things I pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, the fourth seal, right? That's where we are now. Uh, we have looked at three seals before this. Um, and if you have not seen these seals, if you have not seen these videos, you can go back right and you can look at the playlist right entitled friday night bible studies right under this under this playlist right you can see um, the study on the first second third seals right as i go into the fourth one now the fourth seal is taken actually from revelation 6 right verse 7 to verse 8 right and i think this picture does say a lot concerning what we will be studying right now revelation 6 7 to 8 um, this is what it say and when he had opened the fourth seal i heard the voice of the fourth beast say come and see and i look and behold a pale horse and his name that sat on him was dead and El follow with him, and power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth, to kill with the sword, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beast of the earth. Now, from what we have read a while ago, right, there are certain symbols, there are certain signs, right, that jumps out at us. The first one is that the horse is represented as being pale in color, right? The rider on the horse is dead, right? It says that L was following death. It says that they had power over a fourth part of the earth, or 25% of the earth right persons were being killed in various ways right so that's what we see coming out of the fourth scene pale horse rider is dead el follows dead right 25 percent of the earth they had power over persons were being killed in various ways so these are the, the things that we see the symbols we see coming out in the pale arse period now from our previous studies we would have known that arse is a symbol for church but what does paleness mean now let's look at what paleness mean paleness or pale does not appear much in the bible 
but when it does appear it's always not good in Jeremiah 30 verse 5 to 8 it says for thus saith the Lord we have heard a voice of trembling of fear and not of peace Verse 6, As ye now, and see whether a man doth travail with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands and his loins as a woman in travail, and all faces are turned into paleness? Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. For it shall come to pass in that day, say the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off thy neck, and will burst thy bonds, and strangers shall no more serve themselves of him. So what we recognize is that people faces were turning pale. Why? Because something destructive, something diabolic something not so good was about to take place and the bible described this uh, in verse 7 as the time of jacob's trouble so we can see here that paleness is associated with a time of trouble and in particular it was referring to jacob's time of trouble right which is something that is said to happen again in these last days for the church at the end time they are to go through a similar experience as Jacob goes through Jacob's time of trouble now the question one might want to ask is what happened in the time of Jacob's trouble Jacob was in the wilderness he was fearful that his brother would slay him Jacob did soul searching and God transformed his character. Like Jacob, the church of God was in the wilderness, according to Revelation 12, verse 13 to verse 15. Right, and you can go and read that in Revelation 12, 13 to 15. Right? But let's look shortly, right? The time of Jacob's trouble. Jacob was in the wilderness. But the church not so long ago, right, was also in the wilderness right and this as we say before you can when you have time you can pause the video right and you can read revelation 12 verse 13 verse 14 verse 15 but i want to say this about this time period when you go through this you recognize that the woman which was which is a symbol of the church it was being persecuted and verse 14 says that the church right fly into the wilderness Right, and there she, the church is nourished for a time, times and a half from the face of the serpent. Right, so time, time and a half, right, is a symbol for 1260 years. Right, and this period was from 538 AD to 1798 AD. In this period, the true church of God had to be in the literal wilderness. Because the church as it is could not be in the populated era in the metropolis because the church was being widely persecuted right by the dragon Satan and by his human agencies by the kings of Europe by the church leaders in the Roman church in Europe right and also the common people right they persecuted the church of God so much so that the church of God had to be in the wilderness right and there God nourish the church and still keep the church alive according to Revelation 12 and verse 14. Now, this quotation right here I'm going to read from Great Controversy, chapter 4, page 64. This is a book written by Ellen G. White, right? And this is what it says. The faith which was held and taught by the Waldensian Christian was in marked contrast to the false doctrines put forth from Rome, the religious belief was founded upon the written word of God, the true system of Christianity. But those humble peasants in their obscure retreat, shut away from the world and bound to daily toil among their flocks and their vineyards, had not by themselves arrived at the truth. 
in opposition to the dogmas and heresies of the apostate church. There was not a faith newly received. Their religious belief was their inheritance from their fathers. They contend for the faith of the apostolic church, the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. That's according to Jude 3. The church in the wilderness and not the proud hierarchy enthroned in the world's great capital was the true church of Christ, the guardian of the treasures of truth which God has committed to his people to be given to the world. Right? And so the Waldensians, right, they had to be in the wilderness, literally. Right? They were one of the most persecuted groups, right, by the church at Rome, by the, 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 the monarchs in Europe from 538 until 1798. Right now, the question one might ask is, why was the church in the wilderness? Right, a little while ago, we hinted at it, that the church was being persecuted, hence why it had to be in the wilderness and not in the open. Now, what another cause, or the primary cause for the church being persecuted and for the church being in the wilderness was actually apostasy, right? For those who had been here for the third seal study, you would actually realize that under the third seal, right, the church of God turned away from the true principles of Christianity. And a lot of false teachings, right, comes in to the Christian church in the third seal period, right? And if you have not seen that video, you can go and watch it. Right, the third seal. This apostasy was not accepted by everyone. And so as they read the scriptures, they realize that what the church is teaching right, and what the Bible is teaching is different. Right? And so when they start to say, we cannot have this and we cannot have that, it's against what God says. Then the leaders of the church and those who think that they have achieved salvation, Right, decide we don't want to hear this, we don't want to hear what scripture says, we want to do our own thing. And if you cannot get in line, you are going to be persecuted. And that's exactly what happened. Those who says that the church was going off key, right, these persons were widely persecuted by the church, and so they had to be in the wilderness. Now the fourth seal period right also is in alignment with revelation 3 verse 2 and verse 1 which revelation 3 verse 1 and verse 2 actually talks about the church at sardis and talking about the church at sardis the scripture says and unto the angel of the church in sardis write these things said he that are the seven spirits of god and the seven stars i know thy work that thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. And so the church of Sardis, scripture says they had a name that they live, but the church of Sardis was dead. Right? So in the, in the fourth seal period, right, the church was dead. Right, if you look at our modern um, usage for pale, we recognize that paleness is associated with death. So if you look at for those persons out there who don't believe in God and have esoteric teaching or, or teaching in life after death, they would represent the dead or those who have died as being pale. Right? And that's actually a thing because when a person become really sick, you will realize that they start to change color, right, from their normal color, they become more pale, right? So we recognize then that paleness is a symbol for dying, right? And it's also a symbol for God's church being persecuted and going through a time of trouble. Now the church at Sardis, the scripture says, was, was dead. But then he goes on to says in Revelation 3 verse 4, 
It says, Though ask a few names, even in Sardis, which are not defiled their garments, they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. So this is letting us know that in Sardis, there are persons that were faithful. So though the church was dead, the church was in apostasy, right? There were persons in the church who were faithful and who would walk with God in white. But the question one would like to ask is, who are these persons who are faithful in Sardis? Now, Daniel chapter 11 is also another scripture that is in alignment with the fourth seal period, right? That is in alignment with the church of Sardis period, right? And in Daniel 11, it actually tells us in Daniel 11, right, of persons who were faithful in this time period. In Daniel 11, it says, An arm shall stand at his part. And they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice. They shall place the abomination that make it desolate. And so this is talking about the anti-Christian power. And our arms was given to this anti-Christian power. What we just read a while ago is talking about what happened in 538 AD when the church at Rome was given military might or given military protection. And so the church right comes under the protection right and not just the protection but come to a place where it was head over the military and head over governments right and this the scripture says would equal terrible results in verse 32 of daniel 11 it says and such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries but the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. No doubt these are the faithful ones that he's talking about. Right? Those who know their God shall be strong and do exploit. Now verse 33 says, And they that understand among the people shall instruct many, yet they shall fall by the sword and by flame, by captivity and by spoil many days. So in the church at Sardis, it tells us that the church that was dead, Right, that it had a few persons in there who will walk with God in white for they are worthy. Now, in Daniel 11 verse 33, it says that those who understand among the people in this time of apostasy, right, they shall instruct many, they shall teach people, but they shall fall by the sword and by flame, by captivity and by spoil many days. So those who are faithful, they would be persecuted, right? Now, verse 34 says, Now when they shall fall, they shall be open with a little help, but many shall cleave to them with flatteries. 35. And some of them of understanding shall fall to try them and to purge and to make them white, even to the time of the end, because it is yet for a time appointed so among those who are faithful right that would instruct many right a lot of persecution would happen to them a time of trouble would have happened to them but who are these people that daniel 11 33 is talking about right that revelation 3 verse 4 is talking about that revelation 6 Verse 7 and 8 is talking about. Who are these people who remain faithful? Who are these people that teach many in the time of the fourth hour period? A period in which the church was dead, right? And needed to be revived spiritually. Who are these people? Now, looking at the screen, right, you will see at the top the reformers. Now, the painting to your right. Right, you can see the face, you can see the figures of various reformers. Right, and we're going to look at some of them briefly. Now I'm reading from Living Lutheran, right, that org. And it's entitled Reformation 550 Reformation Figures. And we're not going to go to all 50 Reformation Figures. And this is from the year 2017 right we're just gonna look at a few briefly and talk about what they did 
right? The first name we see on that list, right, is John Wycliffe. And John Wycliffe is often thought of being the morning star of the English Reformation, right? He was an English uh, reformer before even the, 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 the normally accepted date of the start of the Reformation. Wycliffe lived from 1329 to 1384, right? He was like the first English. He was the one that um, translated the scripture first into English. Um, he, he was so hated, right? That he died of sickness and later on the papists, right, would um, dig up his grave and burn his bones. Now, John Oss, right, he was the Czech reformer. Um, he was also burned at the stake, right? He accepted John Wycliffe's teachings and he, he spread the, the gospel of reformation in Czech Republic, what is called Czech Republic today. Um, Jerome of Prague was um, John Oss' friend. He was also burned at the stake, right? There was one time where he had um, retracted Right, he goes against teachings, goes against the reform teachings, right, and then he recognizes what he have done, and he and he um, stand for the truth at last, and he was burned at the stake. Now, for um, and his Gutenberg, right, he was the man that come up with the first movable typewriting and the first printer um, in the 1400s, right, and. An interesting fact is that the Bible right, was the first book to be printed at this printing press, right? And the printing press was so timely in its coming about. It helped to spread um, the gospel, the reformed gospel. And there is so much name. Of course, you know Martin Luther. Everyone know Martin Luther. Um, Martin Luther right, was so influential. He influenced a lot of the Reformation um, in the 15th century. A lot of those who become reformers after right, were, were inspired by his work. Now, if you look at nine, you'll see Ulrich Zwingli. Um, he was central figure of the Swiss Reformation. Right, He was a priest who led an alliance and reform of reform, Swiss Confederation, um, cantons against Rome. Zwingli was killed in battle, but Zurich would remain a Protestant city. Right, so he was killed in his fight against um, Roman army, Roman Catholic army that wanted to wipe out the Reformation. Now Erasmus, we know Erasmus, um, Joan Oeclampadius. I don't know if I pronounced that right. Um, there's so much more names. You see, Thomas Cranmer, he was an English reformer. Um, there's so much reformer. We have Philip Malangton at 19 right here. He was um, one that was like the right-hand man for Martin Luther. Right, He was instrumental in the German Reformation, which Martin Luther himself was um, a major part. Um, Henry, um, you see a number 24, Henry. Um, the King of England from 1509 to 1547. I would not say like Henry VIII was like a reformer because he was not really a reformer. That's why the church that he later on founded, right, the Anglican Church or the Church of England, um, it keeps all the rites and all the ceremonies and all the teachings of the church at Rome. Now, William Tyndale, he was the English scholar and theologian. Tyndale produced one of the first English translations of the Bible. He was convicted of heresy and he was executed. His last words were reported, Lord, open the King of England eyes. So, William Tyndale... Right. If you notice, a lot of persons who were burned at the stake, and a little later on, as we go on in the presentation, we we'll recognize that there was such a, a organization or such a system put in place by the Roman papacy or the anti-Christian power 
right that um carry out these execution these killings right and as we come down the list we see menno simmons um it's from menno simmons that the mennonites the mennonite church all right come about he was the central leader of the anabaptists right Now, John Calvin at 37, we know John Calvin, well-known figure in the Reformation. says the most prominent figure of the Reformation, second generation, French theologian Calvin worked to reform the church in Geneva, Switzerland. His institutes of the Christian religion helped to form the basis for Calvinism or the reform tradition. All right, William Farrell at 39. I John Knox um, at 40 he was a Scottish um, reformer. Um, George Wishart was also a Scottish um, reformer. Right, he was burned at the stake for heresy. It's his martyrdom encouraged Knox and others to spread the movement. Right. There is so much. Right. When you have time, right, you can can come on this website and can read through all the, the great reformers, right? And you're gonna see why there is still this rift between the Protestant Church and the Catholic Church, right? Now, the all of these men they try to instruct the people of God into um, the Bible's teaching. But the church at Rome says, no, it's not, it's not the Bible that should tell the people, it's the traditions of the church. And so they had this rift between what they were teaching and what the Catholic church was teaching. And it was decreed that these teachers were heretics and that they were to be killed. Now, the principles of the Protestant Reformation, of which we have looked at some of the figures not so long ago, was one sola scriptura and sola scriptura mean scripture only the bible only now sola gratia right mean grace only or grace alone sola fide mean only faith solus christus mean only christ and um, soli dio gloria Right, mean to God's glory only. Right? So these were the five tenets or five principles on which the church in the reform period, right, of the fifteen hundreds up to the seventeen hundreds, these were the principles that 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 governed the movement, that governed the church coming out right of the third seal apostasy. Right now, the church at Rome had a formidable weapon against the reformers, those who were trying to bring the people back to the scripture, back to faith in Christ, back to giving glory to God. Right? The church at Rome had something called the Inquisition. Right? And go with me. As we read a bit about what the Inquisition was. Now I'm reading from Fox's Book of Martyrs. Right? I'm reading from Fox's Book of Martyrs. And this says the martyrdom of John Kalas. Right? And it says this. When the Reformed religion began to diffuse the gospel light throughout Europe, Pope Innocent III entertained great fear for the Romish Church. He, in, he accordingly instituted a number of inquisitors, or persons who were to make inquiry after, apprehend and punish heretics. <laughs> As the reform were called by the papists, at the head of these inquisitors was one Dominic, who had been canonized by the Pope. In order to render his authority to more 
respectable Dominic and the other inquisitors spread themselves into various Roman Catholic countries and treated the Protestants with the utmost severity, right? In process of time, the Pope, not finding these roving inquisitors so useful as he had imagined, resolved upon the establishment of fixed and regular courts of inquisition. After the order for these regular courts, the first office of the Inquisition was established in the city of Toulouse, which is France, and Dominic became the first regular inquisitor, as he had before been the first roving inquisitor. Courts of Inquisition were now erected in several countries, right, based on, on my reading. Right, Court of Inquisition was established right in Chile, in Peru, in Guatemala, right, um, in Spain, in Portugal, in France, right, and I'm not sure if I'm missing out another country, but based on my reading, it was seven countries, right, that the, the Inquisition was primarily, yeah, Brazil was primarily um instituted so but the spanish inquisition became the most powerful and the most dreadful of any even the kings of spain themselves right though arbitrary in all other respects were taught to dread the power of the lords of the inquisition and the horrid cruelties they exercise compel multitudes who differ in opinion from the Roman Catholics carefully to conceal their sentiments. The most zealous of all the Popish monks and those who most implicitly obeyed the Church of Rome were the Dominicans and the Franciscans. These therefore the Pope thought proper to invest with an in, in exclusive right of proceeding over the different courts of Inquisition and gave them the most unlimited powers as judges delegated by him and immediately representing his person they were permitted to ex they were permitted to excommunicate or sentence to death whom they thought proper upon the most slight information of heresy they were allowed to pu to publish crusades against all who they deem heretics and enter into leagues with sovereign princes to join their crusades with their forces. In 1244, their power was further increased by Emperor Frederick II, who declared himself the protector and friend of all inquisitors, and published the cruel edicts, this one, that all heretics who continue obstinate should be burned, that all heretics who repented should be imprisoned for life. This zeal in the emperor for the inquisitors of the Roman Catholic persuasion arose from a report which had been pro propagated through Europe that he intended to renounce Christianity and turn to Mohammedan. The emperor therefore attempted by the height of bigotry to contradict the report and to show his attachment to popery by cruelty. Now, there's so much things. This the Inquisition was so cruel, right? And it wasn't that just, it wasn't just the Protestants that the Inquisition um, persecuted or killed or burned, right? The Jews were at the forefront also of these persecution. And anyone that teach anything that goes against what the Church deems to be true, they were brought to these courts of Inquisition. And if you notice what it says here, right, if a person remain obstinate, as in do not repent of this, this, the quote-unquote heresy, they were to be burnt. But in two it says, if they repented, they were to be jailed forever. What's the difference, right? These courts were so um, uh, without human rights, right, that... <laughs> Once you, you, you reach to this court, you are guilty. It's not like the courts of today where you go and sit down, you talk, and the other side go and sit down and talk, and then decide who is telling the lion what punishment should be meted out or whatever. Not in this court. Once you turn up before 
this court, you are guilty and you're going to be punished. And whether you repent or whether you stay abstinent, you're still going to be punished. Right? This is what the Inquisition was. It was such a dreadful thing. People were burned at the stake. Uh, persons were sawn apart. The, the methods of cruelty that existed in the Roman Inquisition, led out by the Roman Catholic Church and its priests, right, was is something that the, the half of which might not be known until time turns into eternity. <coughs> The St. Bartholomew Massacre. All of this was taking place. In, the church was going through a time of tribulation, persecution, death. Remember, it says in the fourth seal that persons would be dying. Right? This is exactly what was taking place in these times in the 1500s. People were dying. The church was almost dead. Right? God was seeking to reform the church to the reformers, but they also were killed. Right, according to Daniel. And in 1572, right, the Saint Bartholomew Massacre take place. Right, some persons might not have heard about this before, right, but let's look at it shortly. Let's look at a short version of it. Now, the Saint Bartholomew Massacre was a wave of mob violence directed against the French Protestant Huguenot minority by the Catholic majority. The massacre killed more than 10,000 people over a period of two months in the fall of 1572. Right? And it's in recent times that the church at the, the Pope of Rome right, apologized again for the church in carrying out right, these, these great human abuses and cruelty to God's creation. Now, almost a century later, it gets worse. That picture over on the right side tells the true story of how cruel these persecutions were. Now, the Piedmont Easter Massacre, 1655. In 1655, troops were stationed with Waldensian families and began to massacre the population. The Protestant valleys of the Piedmont became Roman Catholic once more. These massacres, known as the Piedmont Easter Massacre, or the Bloody Spring, arose in indignation in Cromwell's England. It also prompted the poet John Milton to describe the massacre in a famous poem. Alan and in the rest of Europe were deeply shocked at such cruelty. Mazarin himself intervened. At the same time, guerrilla warfare continued in the Piedmont Valleys, fought by a handful of indemitable soldiers led by a farmer, Geneva who is a legend in Waldensian history. Due to international pressure, the Duke of Savoy had to give in and abide by the conditions of the Cavour Agreement. The Waldensians were able to go back to their valleys, but the Duke put more and more pressure on them as time went by. And I read from mosiprotestant.org, History of the Waldensians. So in 1655, Right, the church at Rome and the Duke of Savoy decide that they're gonna get rid of the Waldensian heretics. Right? And those persons were they were styled as heretics, they were styled as witches, they were styled as enemies of law and order. Right? And this is how um, they go about to massacre um, the Waldensian Christians. Now, my final word that I want to leave with everyone. If you notice all the things that we have covered tonight, this, all of this happened under the fourth seal. But as we go down in Revelation 6, we recognize that these things that happened to the church in the fourth seal, 
will happen to the church again in the last times. Second Thessalonians 2 tell us that the day of Christ coming will not come, else there come a falling away, right, an apostasy, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. The Antichrist will be revealed. The Antichrist power we look at in the third seal. The Antichrist power we look at tonight and we see the works of the Antichrist power tonight. This same Antichrist power will regain worldwide dominion. And as we speak, it's regaining worldwide dominion. And this power right, will go about persecuting people as it did 500 years ago. So what I'm saying and what I want to leave with us and that is fourth seal study is that we are to get ready for the great day of Ed. Just like God allowed some of these faithful, some of his faithful followers to be killed, right? Or he allowed them to face hard times, right? So they can be tried and be purged and be made white. That's the purging. That's the cleansing that is coming for the church in these last times. But just remember that God is able keep his church and God is able to keep his people um, from falling so for all those persons who might be going through challenges right now just remember what the church of the Middle Ages the church in the wilderness had gone through right so I have said a lot in this study right and I'm not gonna make it any longer and as usual John chapter 8 states when you know the truth, the truth will make you free. So from now until we meet and next time, God be with you and be blessed.